Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our virtual workshop for the Climate Mitigation and Adaptation Plan. We're taking a couple minutes here at the, at the beginning to allow folks to come online and join us. So we'll get started in a couple minutes. Okay, well, while you are waiting, um, we do have a, a short poll that um, you're welcome to take. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll now. You should be able to uh, see the poll about the middle of your screen. And there are four questions available to you. So after you've uh, answered number one and number two, use the slider bar on the right side to scroll down to see three and four. Great, looks like many of you are finding that. For those of you who are just now joining us, we have a, a short poll available in the, should be visible on your screen with four questions. So scroll down to be able to, to uh, participate in all four questions. And we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes, right about 6.35. Great. So to the new folks, we have, uh, this is the San Carlos Climate Mitigation Adaptation Planning Workshop, and we have a short Zoom poll available to you to take now while, um, while we wait on a couple more people to join us. We're gonna get started here actually in just a second, just a minute. Okay. So uh, good evening, I'm Tammy Seal with PlaceWorks. I'm a consultant to the city of San Carlos for the Climate Mitigation and Adaptation Plan. And we're really excited that you chose to join us this evening for our second workshop as we're getting started on the preparation of the Climate Action Plan. A couple housekeeping notes as we get started. One, we wanna make sure you know that tonight's workshop is being recorded, at least while we're in this main room together. This workshop does include an opportunity for us to talk to each other in what we call breakout rooms. So there will be small group discussions later, and then we'll come back together um, to wrap up the evening. So our format will include um, a presentation question and answer, and then the small group uh, discussions. So we have the short poll for you to take now, and we're gonna get started here in just a moment. Um, So I uh, also wanted to remind uh, folks that if you, for those um, 
in your emails from the city re related to your registration, you likely received a link to climate action or climate mitigation adaptation plan materials. So there were um, handouts that support the presentation that we'll be going through tonight. And um, those are all available on the city's website. So if you um, don't have those handy and wanted to reference those now, feel free to take a moment to open um, that up in a separate browser tab to have those handy. You don't have to have them available to you while you're going through the workshop, but just wanted to remind you that they're there as good resources now or later. Okay. So I'm gonna wrap up the poll. Looks like um, most folks have taken it. So I'm gonna give about one more minute to, um, to participate in the poll. It's mostly a warm up. And actually, if you've taken the poll, that last question lets us know if we need to go through some additional um, material related to how to use Zoom. And from what I can tell, you're all expert users. <laughs> so uh, we'll be skipping the part of our presentation that normally requires um, that uh, has some tips for it. But if you at any time have questions uh, related uh, to the technical part, the logistics, the Zoom component, we do uh, encourage you to send those questions to us in the chat. So we have a member of our team um, is identified as Zoom questions, ask me. So if you have any issues about how the meeting is working, um, your connection, feel free to send those. That Those are gonna go to Tarina Wilson on our team. And we do um, have your, everyone is on mute now while we're in the main room. So we do ask that you send us project questions as well through the chat feature. And you'll be able to send those to project hosts, uh, including myself and I'm identified as project questions, ask me, Tammy. So do feel free to send us uh, your notes and questions through the chat as you have them tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and we are um, gonna go ahead and get started. So I'd like um, as to welcome Mayor Ron Collins. Thank you, uh, Tammy. Um, and welcome everyone to our second uh, Climate Action Workshop. And thanks for joining us. This is a very important discussion. And we strive to generate discussion and promote community engagement regardless of the circumstances. At this time, I'd like to introduce um, a couple of my fellow council members. Uh, council member Sarah McDowell is with us. And I believe uh, Vice Mayor Laura Palmer Lohan is either with us or will join us very soon. Um, we recognize the necessity of taking local action to solve large scale problems such as climate change. As we've seen with the coronavirus pandemic response, our local governments and institutions play a key role in serving our communities to address issues that are bigger than any one community. In San Carlos, we are lucky to have many partners to help us serve San Carlos. We look forward to the discussion on possible actions we can take to address climate change across energies, energy sectors, transportation, land use, and waste management that will foster a more sustainable community. At the same time, we want to better understand how San Carlos is vulnerable to some of the hazards posed by climate change, such as extreme heat, wildfires, sea level rise, and to proactively identify strategies to adapt to these threats. The ultimate goal of this type of long-term strategic planning is to foster a sustainable community while enhancing the quality of life we have all come to enjoy in the city of San Carlos. So, Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to the presentation and group discussions and I am going to bow out because I'm going to avoid a Brown Act uh, violation tonight. I wish you all well and I'm going to turn it back over to Tammy Seal with PlaceWorks to start the presentation. Thank you Mayor Collins. Um, thanks so much for welcoming us tonight and to those of you who are, are just joining us you're coming on at the right time where uh, we are getting started now with our presentation so tonight what we have a brief presentation to um, orient you to the climate mitigation and adaptation plan we'd like to you know be able to share what we expect will be in it 
um, to provide an update on the city's uh, progress since the adoption of its first climate action plan and to share with you the results of the preliminary technical analyses that our team has conducted to date. We'll have opportunity for um, a few questions after the presentation and then we'll go into the, the breakout rooms that I mentioned earlier where we uh, really encourage you to have a conversation. Um, we expect those to be small groups. We have a set of questions uh, for you to go through with our facilitators. We will be taking notes um, to ensure that we have good documentation of what you're sharing with us and for us to be able to review and reflect on later as we work toward the next part of the climate mitigation and adaptation plan. After the breakout room discussions, we'll come together briefly to share what we discussed and then wrap up. So we will fill um, the time we've set aside for, for the workshop this evening. This is the second of two workshops. Uh, if you joined us for the first workshop, then you're very familiar with what um, the presentation is the same. The discussion questions are, are the same. The participants, um, of course, are a little bit different tonight. So. Um, I do want to share the results of the poll that you all took a little earlier. So it's great to see um, that many of you here tonight are participating in your first workshop. So thanks for picking the climate mitigation and adaptation plan as your first workshop. Um, and you're all about split on previous participation in the city council meeting. Um, and it looks like this, the city's uh, kind of many of the city's communication tools were, uh, reached you all. Uh, but what I see here is that the, the network is what gets us together, our friends and colleagues. So, um, you know, I'll remind you at the end of the evening that your charge after tonight will be to take what you heard and learned and share it back with your network of friends um, to encourage, you know, everyone in your network to continue to participate in the planning process for this plan. Uh, and it looks like you're all very familiar with Zoom, but as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions as we go through the evening related to Zoom, please send those to us uh, through the Zoom, quest uh, Zoom questions, ask me, one of our co-hosts, and if you have project questions, please send those to me. Uh, I'm identified as project questions, ask me. And um, we will answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation and, um, and anything that we don't answer this evening, we will uh, provide in a, in a written post online after the workshop. So I wanted to introduce a few uh, members of our project team. It's a little challenging on Zoom sometimes, but our uh, city project management team is here tonight from the city manager's office. Uh, Tara Peterson is the assistant city manager. Adam Lacar is uh, the sustainability specialist and your key point of contact. And Nicole Scott is part of the CMAP team as well. I'm Tammy Seal, project manager uh, for the PlaceWorks team. And tonight I'm joined by my colleagues, Eli Crispy, Jacqueline Protzman, and Tarina Wilson. And you'll see all of these folks in your breakout rooms. Um, we also have a great group of city staff who are here tonight to support with facilitation and note taking. And you'll be able to identify them um, by their name and also when you're in your small group rooms. So I think we can skip through these and jump right in. So I'm gonna turn it over to Adam to get us started. Great, thanks, Tammy. Um, well, just a little, a little background on this. We do have an existing climate action plan and then what we're doing is developing a, a new one, essentially. Um, the, the first original climate action plan was adopted in 2009. It was part of the, uh, the general plan update at the time. Um, it's a strategic plan to reduce community-wide uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it did so, it, it uh, adhered to all the, the CEQA guidelines. It was a qualified greenhouse gas reduction strategy. Um, it set the target of reducing emissions 15% um, below 2005 levels by, by this year, 2020. And to do that, uh, the plan identified 21 uh, specific steps uh, to reach that target. So, uh, and then in 2015, uh, there was a uh, an interim assessment to kind of confirm some of the progress towards those targets and make any sort of uh, necessary adjustments. Great, 
I think, Eli, is this you? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to provide uh, a little uh, additional background information on some of the work that we've done so far uh, and what we'll be doing over the course of this project. So as Adam mentioned, uh, the CAP was adopted in 2009, and since then, uh, the city and community members have taken really uh, significant steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is just a list of uh, a few of the actions that San Carlos has taken. It includes everything from increased renewable energy and improved public transit options uh, to actions that help uh, the city government improve its internal operations uh, and continue to show leadership on climate action and help build support for community steps. So the existing CAP has been very successful. Uh, but there is now a need to update the document in response to new state regulations and conditions. And this updated document is what we're calling the CMAP, the Climate Mitigation and Adaptation Plan. The CMAP will provide San Carlos's strategic pathway towards a more sustainable and a more resilient future uh, to achieve future reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the CMAP will be based on a technical foundation that will be uh, translated to staff and community stakeholders in relevant, accessible languages, uh, accessible formats. And we're really hoping that this is done in a way that's very open and fosters a very productive dialogue and engagement. We want the CMAP to be very responsive to the unique conditions that are present in San Carlos. It needs to be practical and it needs to be useful to elected officials and city staff, as well as to community members. It needs to be easily understood. It needs to be feasible. It really needs to be appropriate for San Carlos and to work with what the community wants and to fit in with the community vision. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be equitable. And as I mentioned, it should be transparent and be developed in partnership with community members and other stakeholders. And of course, we also want it to be grounded in accepted science and be really consistent with the adopted regulations and the state's guidance. This will all help ensure that the CMAP has a very strong technical and a very strong legal foundation. So part of why we are doing this update is in response to some new state efforts. So the state has adopted some new longer term greenhouse gas reduction targets and goals. And we really wanna keep San Carlos's greenhouse gas reduction efforts consistent with what the state is doing. We also wanna to respond to some new state laws that require communities to plan for the risk posed by climate change and to increase their resilience to natural hazards. Uh, so we'll be including those requirements and those efforts in the CMAP uh, in accordance with state guidance. So the CMAP is being prepared through a three-phase process. And right now we're really wrapping up phase one. This is the technical work that sets the foundation for the rest of the project. And moving forward into the rest of fall and into early 2021, uh, we'll be preparing draft strategies that will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve community resilience. Uh, and then this will all get written up in the plan document itself in the third phase of the project. Throughout the entire timeline, uh, we have community outreach and engagement activities since that is a critical part of making this plan successful. Uh, community members uh, include residents, businesses, visitors, community organizations and institutions, Everyone that's part of the San Carlos community is really a key partner in helping the city to achieve the short-term and the long-term greenhouse gas reduction goals and the resilience goals that the CMAP will be laying out. So the city is really committed to broad outreach and engagement during the preparation of the project and engagement with stakeholders and with members of the public such as you all. That is all really essential to a successful project. This is a close up of what we've been doing during the phase one of the CMAP process. We have assessed actions that have occurred at the state, regional, and local levels uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to build community resilience. We've prepared a community wide vulnerability assessment, and we have updated the greenhouse gas inventories that say how many greenhouse gas em emissions San Carlos has been generating. So I will go over the results of that work in a moment here. Uh, and then to give you a little close up of what's coming up in future phases of the project, uh, we are going to assess how San Carlos's greenhouse gas emissions are expected to change in the future and what levels the city should strive to reduce those emissions to. 
what should be the reduction targets, we call them. We will be preparing new policies, as I mentioned, and we will develop an implementation program so we can make sure that San Carlos has the tools and the information needed to put this plan into effect. There is also an environmental review process and community engagement will again be ongoing throughout the project. Uh, so I'm now going to walk through some of the technical work that we've done so far uh, on the CMAP. And the, the first item is what's called the community-wide greenhouse gas inventory. This is an assessment of the greenhouse gas emissions that are attributed to San Carlos. So we are accounting for the greenhouse gas emissions from activity members, like residents, businesses, and visitors. And we have assessed greenhouse gas emissions for the calendar year 2005, which sets the baseline conditions against which we measure progress, and then for several interim years since then. So most recently uh, for 2018. And these interim years show the progress that the city has made in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions since 2005. So th these are the results of the greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, as you can see, emissions have declined pretty steadily uh, from 2005 levels. Uh, the teal bar there on the graph, that represents emissions from transportation, uh, vehicles, cars, and trucks on the road. Uh, that is the largest source of San Carlos's greenhouse gas emissions, uh, followed by residential and non-residential energy use which are the light red and the light green bars at the bottom of the graph. Collectively, those are the primary sources of San Carlos's emissions. Uh, as of 2018, San Carlos's greenhouse gas emissions were 25% below 2005 levels. So Adam mentioned earlier, the goal in the existing climate action plan is to reduce emissions 15% below 2005 levels by 2020. So as this, assuming the city maintains this trajectory, uh, San Carlos is on a very good track to meet, or at this rate to exceed, the goal in the existing climate action plan. Uh, to highlight a few specifics from the inventory, uh, there has been a fairly significant decrease in electricity use in San Carlos since 2005, uh, and that's despite a growing population, and that is a sign of really increased energy efficiency in the community, which can be driven by lots of different things, including more energy efficient technology, as well as more energy efficient behavior and people being more energy aware in how they use electricity. 93% uh, of San Carlos's electricity, or excuse me, 91% of San Carlos's electricity comes from Peninsula Clean Energy, which came into effect a few years ago. And uh, about 95% of Peninsula Clean Energy's electricity comes from clean sources. So that has substantially helped to reduce St. Carlos's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there has also been an increase in uh, people driving. Uh, that's probably not a surprise to a lot of you. So there are more cars on the road, people are driving farther, uh, but emissions from vehicles have gone down slightly as cars have gotten cleaner. So the increases in fuel efficiency and more people buying hybrids and electric vehicles, those have helped to offset the increase in people commuting and uh, driving their cars. Uh, there's also been less water use in 2018 than there was in 2005. And that's also likely due to people being more aware about how they're using water. Um, we've noticed statewide there's been a decrease since the drought occurred a few years ago uh, and the increased availability of water efficient technologies and other resources. So that is the greenhouse gas inventory side. And then on the other side is the other technical analysis that we've done, and this is what's called the vulnerability assessment. Uh, the vulnerability assessment is the foundation of the climate resilience part of the, of the CMAP. It's an assessment that describes how climate-related hazards, uh, such as wildfire and sea level rise, are expected to change over the course of the next several decades and what sort of risk those changes in these climate related hazards may pose to San Carlos. So the vulnerability assessment identifies the people and the uh, community assets, uh, buildings, infrastructure, community services, and so on, uh, that are most at risk from these climate related hazards and tries to get a sense of just how susceptible they really are. So the idea is that it will identify who in the community is most at risk. 
The vulnerability assessment builds on a lot of existing work that's been completed over the past few years. The county has been taking a lot of steps to identify its, its vulnerability. There's been quite a bit of regional efforts around the Bay Area, and California has done a lot of steps on the uh, course as well. So we're going to be bringing in all of these existing resources to help bolster the argument for who and what in San Carlos is most susceptible. The uh, vulnerability assessment will also tie in to the general plan update uh, that the city is working on. Uh, the vulnerability assessment will help to meet some of the requirements uh, for that general plan update that the state mandates. So the vulnerability assessment really seeks to answer a few key questions. It uh, tries to analyze, as I mentioned, who are or what is the biggest hazard of concern or the biggest hazards of concern in San Carlos, how people and how community assets in the community may be affected, and then who and what in San Carlos is most vulnerable to climate change and specifically to which hazards. Uh, ultimately, this will inform policies in the CMAP that will uh, narrow in on those, if you will, priority vulnerabilities to really help reduce vulnerability uh, and build a more resilient community. So here, these are some of the pieces that are going into the vulnerability assessment, some of the factors we're considering. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen in blue, those are the different hazards that we are assessing. So we are looking not only at, if you will, the more common natural disasters, things like wildfire and flood, uh, but we're also looking at uh, hazardous conditions that are expected to unfold over a longer period of time. Things like sea level rise, and drought, uh, things that don't take effect immediately, but which may have a significant impact on the community. And then we are also assessing uh, six different categories of populations and assets in San Carlos. Uh, and those are shown on the right hand side in kind of a teal green color. Uh, and then within each of these different categories, there are a number of specific population groups and community assets that are being included. So for example, uh, populations is one kind of broad category of, uh, that will be assessed in the vulnerability assessment. But then within that group, we will be looking separately at your citizens and persons experiencing homelessness and persons with disabilities and many other different groups of people who may face an increased risk from climate change related hazards. I did wanna show this map to just identify some of the areas of concern in San Carlos that we'll be looking at. Uh, we found that by 2050, there may be some permanent flooding from sea level rise that could penetrate as far inland uh, as industrial road in a lot of cases. Uh, and then closer to the, the foothill areas, uh, many of those parts of the community may be at significant risk of wildfire. Uh, there is also an increased risk of flooding around some of the creeks and some of the low-lying areas closer to the shoreline uh, and a little south of downtown. Uh, so this is sort of the kind of base case for the areas in San Carlos that may be most at risk of different hazards. But certainly this doesn't mean that areas outside of these hazard zones are immune. So for example, if the Caltrain line gets flooded, you know, that will likely impact many people in San Carlos, regardless of whether you live in a, an area that's at risk of flooding or not. So we, we're thinking not only where are people and where are assets located, but also what are the other people and assets and systems and services that they all depend on and how might there be indirect impacts from climate change that could have a much greater effect across the entire community and really across the region. Uh, these are some of the main takeaways from the vulnerability assessment. Uh, there are a lot more detailed results behind this, but some of the key salient points are that there are expected to be an increased risk of extreme heat days uh, and then combined with uh, increased pollution from wildfires as I think many of us have become painfully aware of over the, over the past few months. Uh, these are all likely to create an increase in health risks for many different populations. Uh, we have found that sea level rise, as we showed on the map, is expected to cause not only permanent, but also some temporary flooding near the shore that may affect transportation networks. And it also may affect uh, economic activity in the community. So a lot of businesses 
a lot of offices, a lot of jobs in the areas that are at risk of sea level rise and uh, impacts of sea level rise on the business, on the buildings where those businesses are located may have some adverse economic effects. Uh, senior citizens, persons with disabilities, uh, others with limited mobility, uh, they are likely to face some challenges during evacuation events, uh, wildfires, floods, landslides, and so on. And th as those events become more frequent, there's a, an increased risk from those uh, evacuation challenges that may pose health and safety hazards. Uh, flooding, landslides, wildfires, these are all hazards that are likely to pose an increased risk of property and infrastructure damage throughout the community. And then ecosystems in San Carlos are also under threat from droughts, uh, extreme heat events, and flooding. Uh, we've also found in the vulnerability assessment that there are several potential disruptions to the energy networks in the community. Uh, wildfires, extreme heat, and severe weather are really the prime sources of disruption to the energy network. And that is also, I think, something that we've seen lately uh, and are likely to see more of in the future. So fortunately, you know, despite this being a lot of potentially serious issues and some uh, real topics of concern, there are actions that can be taken to help address these vulnerabilities and reduce the risk to the community. So this is sort of the, the base case. This is the challenge that we in that San Carlos faces and now what we're trying to do through the CMAP is how does the community rise to the challenge and adapt to these conditions and ensure greater resiliency so that these become uh, a lot less harmful to public health and public safety uh, and to property and to the economy and really making sure that the city is in a good position uh, to resist and recover from those effects. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Adam to talk about some of the community engagement activities. Yeah, thanks, Eli, on that happy note. Um, so we're, yeah, we're, it's uh, just to review our, our community engagement strategy. Thank you. Um, it's our intention for this plan to, to really reflect the values, uh, the opinions of, of our community, and therefore um, conducting meaningful outreach is, is crucial to developing a, su a successful plan and doing so that's COVID safe. So thank you for joining us in the, the Zoom format. Um, we're going to be providing multiple ways to provide feedback and at different phases throughout the project. So right now, this is just a, a, an introduction, a review of the technical work we've been doing, and what we'll get to in a minute is just a brainstorming of different strategies. Um, what we'll do with that is we'll, we'll take these, the notes from this meeting and, and kind of start putting together different drafted um, greenhouse gas mitigation and climate adaptation strategies. Um, and then later in the project, we'll, we'll come back to you um, with some of those draft strategies for uh, additional feedback, which we're targeting hopefully for around January timeline. Um, some of the opportunities, you know, we have a, we put out newsletters, we have a project website. Um, it's just cityofsancarlos.org slash climate, um, where we're, we're constantly uploading new information, new documents. Um, we'll be presenting to our uh, advisory bodies, our, our city commissions, um, hosting workshops like this one, um, and then also holding you know, more small uh, in intimate stakeholder uh, meetings as well. So, um, and ultimately the, the review of draft and the final CMAP will be through uh, public hearings as well. All right, thank you, Adam and Eli for that presentation. So we do have a, a some time available for a few questions and we have been receiving questions uh, in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so there's a question as to whether um, there's an online version of the maps from the vulnerability assessment. And um, Adam, I believe we do not have an online viewer. We have the handouts available. Yes, we should have, um, in the emails you received uh, confirming this, uh, this workshop, there's a, a link and also on the website, there's a link to project handouts, um, which does have uh, the maps that you've just seen um, on there for review. Yeah. And uh, the wildfire uh, information is taken from state resources and this sea level rise data, I believe, as Eli mentioned, is taken from local resources. So. Um, we can also link to the sources which might have more interactive online maps available. 
Uh, Eli, during your presentation on the greenhouse gas emissions, um, there is a question about whether the numbers are per capita or adjusted for increased city population. Uh, they are not adjusted uh, for an increase in population or uh, per capita. They've been off for person numbers. Uh, they're just absolute totals. So I think it's, it's quite notable that even though population has gone up, uh, the emissions have gone down. So I think it's really a testament to what the community members have been doing and to some of the policies and the practices that have helped to reduce the community's greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Thanks. We have a question related to the transportation emissions. Uh, um, are the transportation emissions only vehicle miles traveled within the city limits or all miles by residents, businesses, et cetera? It is vehicle miles traveled but, uh, on, for any trip that begins and or ends in San Carlos. So for example, if you got in your car in San Carlos and drove to San Francisco or drove to San Jose, uh, half of those miles from that trip get attributed to San Carlos. Uh, the other half get attributed to whatever community you're going to. If you begin and end in San Carlos, all of those miles are counted here in this inventory. But if, say, you started in San Jose and drove to San Francisco and just happened to pass through San Carlos, you didn't stop in the community, those miles are not counted here because the trip did not begin or end in, in San Carlos. That's really the factor that we use to assign the vehicle miles traveled. Okay, well, while we're, thanks Eli, while we're on the question of the greenhouse, uh, topic of greenhouse gas emissions, we have a couple more questions. Uh, does the use of solar on homes have an impact on the reduced electricity use that you mentioned during the presentation? or is solar included in our overall consumption? Uh, solar from uh, panels on homes or businesses, those do have an impact on the emissions that we've shown because when we've, the greenhouse gas emissions that we've shown for electricity, those are based on the numbers that we get from PG&E and from PCE. And if you get your electricity from solar panels, those electricity, that electricity use doesn't show up in PG&E or PCE's totals. So using electricity from solar panels makes it look as though uh, the electricity use in the community has gone down. And that, that is definitely part of the factor in helping to reduce the community's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, electricity from large scale solar power plants way off in the desert, that is included in, and that's already factored in. Uh, moving forward, we will be showing the benefits specifically from rooftop solar panels in San Carlos. So we will show how those have specifically reduced greenhouse gas emissions. But, but in these numbers that we're showing you right now, it's just all wrapped into the total. Thanks. I have um, another energy question, which um, there's a question about whether if we know the main driver that resulted in the 39% reduction in GHG from non-residential. We can't say for certain uh, what the single driver is. Uh, there's a lot of potential sources. Uh, it could be increased energy efficiency in non-residential buildings. Uh, it may be changes in weather conditions. You know, a lot of natural gas use uh, is associated with building heating. So if, uh, the, if as the years get uh, warmer, and particularly as winters get warmer, uh, it would not be unexpected to see a decrease in natural gas use just because there's less of a demand for heating. Uh, it could also be changes in certain types of activities. You know, as businesses change, and as the economy in, in San Carlos has changed, uh, businesses that might use larger amounts of natural gas may be replaced by businesses that require less of it. So we can't say for certain, but those are all likely at least play some role in the reduction that we've seen. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question um, back to transportation. There's a question that asks if um, gasoline sales data is factored in um, to the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. 
So gasoline sales data is not. We don't, we don't really look at how much gasoline is sold in San Carlos. Uh, what we're really looking at are those vehicle miles traveled. So independent of gasoline or diesel or electricity or compressed natural gas or any other vehicle fuel, just how far are people traveling on trips that begin and end in San Carlos? That's what informs these VMT numbers. Thanks. Okay, we have a couple of questions related to the vulnerability assessment um, and climate hazard data you shared. So we have a question that asks, uh, if rising groundwater due to sea level rise, is it an issue of consideration in San Carlos? I believe it is considered. Uh, I'm, it's not treated as a separate hazard. You know, we've looked at that as a function of sea level rise uh, and of flooding. So we, we haven't specifically called out the impacts that may occur from uh, increases in groundwater uh, independent of those other flooding and sea level rise events, uh, but it is a part of the assessment. Okay. And I think, yeah, we're, um, and I understand that these, you know, folks have some pretty good questions. For those of you who might be new to the topic, some of these are pretty detailed questions. So some folks have certainly had um, maybe a bit more time than others, uh, but we do want to, we do have time. Um, we have, you know, we're wrap, getting to the point of that. So we wanted to um, make sure that um, we answer the technical questions because once you get into your breakout groups, um, not all of the facilitators might be able to um, provide the same level of detail in the technical response. So we have um, an, a question related to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I guess, Eli, there's a question if, if the, there's a way to quantify uh, the amount of carbon sink that's in San Carlos, such as um, trees and the value uh, benefit that trees have. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so it's not, we haven't shown it here, but we have quantified that. So uh, beginning as of last year, the guidance documents that we follow to prepare the greenhouse gas inventory now requires us to identify the carbon sink, uh, the amount of carbon that is absorbed out of the atmosphere in street trees and in uh, forested areas. So we have quantified that, we have identified that reduction. Uh, it is, if I'm remembering correctly, relatively small uh, on the order of a few hundred metric tons, uh, but it is, uh, it is something we have looked at, and it is something that will inform the policies in the CMAP. Great, thanks. So really appreciate uh, the really thoughtful questions that you've all sent to us this evening. Um, some of you may have had questions that we did not get to. We will uh, follow up uh, with answers to these uh, in our summary that'll be posted online. So. Um, it is the, our intention to share the results of our work as we go through the project. So um, there's, there was a question about when the vulnerability assessment results might be shared. And um, you know, our, our priority after this workshop will be to review all of the public um, comment that we received and prepare a summary of this workshop in the first workshop. So that'll go on uh, online in the next few weeks. And then uh, we expect to have results of the, um, the emissions forecast uh, to prepare us for a conversation the next time we get together about target setting. And we'll also be looking at um, the benefits of existing and planned actions and preparing um, a summary of the vulnerability assessment. So uh, I'd say, you know, keep your eyes on the, the San Carlos CMAP website. I've posted that link in the chat. You all should have received it in your emails from the city. and. Um, Definitely sign up for the sustainability newsletter. That's gonna be the fastest way for you to find out what new information's waiting for you to review online. Um, and so with that, I'd like to get us ready for what's next, which is our breakout room discussions. So I think we can go to the next slide. So right now you are in small groups. 
And uh, this evening, your small groups will probably, you'll have an, a facilitator and a note taker from the project team and from city staff. And your group will have, you know, five to um, eight people in it. So we should be able to have a nice um, intimate conversation. We've structured it, we do have, you will all have the same questions. Um, and we, throughout the, these questions, we'll be able to go over um, each of the sectors in a bit more detail. So energy, transportation, waste, the extreme events that Eli went over. And we also wanna um, hear your thoughts about implementation of you know, the action part of the plan. So um, for those of you who joined us for the first time, um, you're familiar with this format. Uh, what'll happen next is that I'm going to launch our breakout rooms. And if you are not automatically redirected, you might need to look on your screen and see if you need to push up, uh, click a button to enable you to go into the next phase. You'll be in these breakout rooms for about an hour. Um, I will send, uh, you know, we'll send little uh, timing reminders as you go through it. And then they automatically bring you back into this main room where we will share um, the results. So when you go into your breakout room, you're gonna be asked to pick a, a representative from your group who um, will present two highlights from your conversation this evening. But don't worry, even though you're only gonna share two highlights with the large group, we're gonna read everything that you all talked about um, when the evening's over. So I, I get the privilege of reading all the notes from tonight. Um, so you'll see when you go into your breakout room that your note taker is gonna be sharing their screen. And so you can see that your conversation is being recorded uh, for those of us to um, on the project team to review and consider as we go through the CMAP preparation. So with that, I am going to launch you into your breakout rooms now. Um, if you do have any, uh, anything comes up while you're in there, you are able to leave the meeting from the breakout room. You are also able to return to this main room. So if there's anything that comes up, um, you'll, you can come back to the main room and we can help you. Um, and if you, for some reason, um, leave the meeting unintentionally, please feel free to jump back on, click through the link that you have, and we'll get you put right back in a breakout room. So uh, Tarina and I will be here to support any questions that you have. Okay, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. And we're staying with us. Uh, we're gonna turn the recording back on for our last uh, 10 minutes together here as a group. So each group has selected a spokesperson. So we'd like to call on you and have you share a couple highlights, so two highlights from your group's discussion. We know uh, you all had really uh, great conversations. I dropped in to listen to a few of them and troubleshoot on a couple of things. So thanks for your patience if you were in a group that we had to uh, help out a little bit. And right now I would like to call on Daniel to share highlights from the group one discussion. And Daniel, if it would be helpful, we can also share your group's notes. Oh yeah, it would be helpful. Okay, so Tarina is gonna pull those up here. So just give us a few seconds. All right, and if, if you want her to scroll down or anything, just feel free to ask her to do that for you. But yeah, please do. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll try to speak off the cuff. Um, I know that, you know, one of my favorite idea from uh, the conversation was really outreach to schools. Um, uh, I, I thought that was a, a great way to encourage um, things like composting and waste reduction, which is further down. Uh, sorry, it's still top of mind. So it's not right here. But um, was to if you get your kids to do it, you get them to form the habit they will inherently just, I'll just say they, they'll guilt their parents or they'll teach their parents. And it's, it's a good sort of bottom up approach. Um, I know if my kids did that, I would be really inclined to, to kind of make a move. Um, in terms of transportation, um, I think finding ways to, you know, increase the number of uh, uh, chargers uh, around the city, uh, helping apartment buildings do it. 
um, for transit um, would be super helpful. Um, uh, and then climate risk. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone said this, but you know, like, look, fire. There's fire uh, everywhere, um, and focusing on that risk is the highest priority, uh, or should be a very high priority. Um, I live in a low, low, uh, Greater East St. Carlos, very close to the sea. Uh, I feel very threatened there, but it's clear, you know, the fire is the risk. Um, and so anything we can do to encourage um, outreach, education, how to reduce the risk uh, in individuals' homes is super important. Um, and then I'll, I'll, the last point I can recall, which is, uh, is just, I, I think in terms of being a leader, uh, as a city, I, I just think we should operate regionally. And that's at least one thing we briefly, at least I briefly brought up um, uh, and make sure anything we do, because this can be all costly stuff that uh, uh, everyone in the Bay Area is probably trying to do much the same thing we are. So we should try and act as a region and encourage that kind of cooperation. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, group one. Does that cover it? All right. So we will go to group Two's representative, Dan Dempsey. Hi, hello, thank you. Uh, I'll touch on three items uh, with energy. We had a long debate and spirited debate on the energy sector uh, with some good ideas. So on the solar side and the energy generation side, um, helping to inform people, identify if there's solar rebates, educate people on what the options are for solar. Uh, with battery, uh, with PG&E safety shutoffs happening now, is there are there recommendations from San Carlos as to whether people should use battery for backup for short-term outages, or do, are we going to have multi-day outages requiring, you know, uh, fossil fuel or gas power generators? What's recommended there, uh, with the intent, you know, preferably to have as green a solution as possible, uh, plus energy audits for houses. A lot of the houses here are old. I know I had an energy audit and they identified a lot of airflow in and out of the walls and, and places you wouldn't think of, uh, along with replacement of windows, insulation of floors and walls. Uh, those can be very effective ways. And then lastly, um, electrification of home appliances, water heaters and furnaces and stoves. Those can help to improve indoor air quality. The home stoves can pollute quite a bit in your house while you're cooking. Um, so it, on new construction, requiring that for homes and for res, uh, commercial property, those were the items addressed for energy efficiency. On the transportation side, um, you know, it's, it's what can San Carlos do to comply with the new 2035 uh, Newsom sponsored effort to get to eliminate combustion vehicles by then and is there a way to accelerate it through um, uh, you know, converting city vehicles, converting city buses, encouraging homeowners. There was the mention there recently of uh, chargers in, in apartment buildings and other places to help make it more convenient. Um, so that was discussed a fair bit. And then lastly, yeah, a wildfire was another key item. I think if you're talking about climate risks and, and immediacy of climate risks, certainly flooding and other things are a potential risk down the road, but I think we're all aware of the, the dangers of fires. Um, and the hillsides here are very prone to burning. This type of environment historically burned every 10 to 20 years. Um, so what can be done, what is being done on pri uh, public property? I know there's efforts made with goats and other things to reduce the fuel load. Uh, what can be done on private property? I'm familiar with homeowner associations up in the Tahoe region where they actively and require the removal of trees and under uh, pine needles and other brush from the ground. Uh, do we need to implement something like that here for the homes and the hillsides, even if, you know, maybe they don't want to, um, if it's for the greater good, it, it might be necessary. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Dan, for group two. We're going to uh, go out of order and jump to group five. Ellen Garvey, do you have oh, uh, two okay. items? Thanks very much. We had a really robust discussion on each of these items in our, in our group. Um, a couple of things um, jumped out at us. We talked about um, the interde interdependency of our actions, regardless of what top the topic is, that there are really individual things that we can do, but we're a part of larger regional solutions. 
Uh, so if you look at the general development plan for the city of San Carlos, that needs to integrate with the climate action plan with the city, that needs to integrate in with the transportation plan, and there's some real synergy there, uh, our group thought, between all of these actions. And, and building on these plans, um, we talked about um, Caltrain. We have this great train station, it's, uh, uh, and the train runs through San Carlos. It's about to electrify. We're about to get several new employers east of San Carlos, east of the train station. It would be nice to have people be able to easily get from the train station to these new places of work. Um, regarding water usage, very uh, concerned about um, the water table that is rising for folks that live down near the water. Um, and then the flip side of that is people who live up in the hills need water to keep some of the vegetation damp so that the fire danger is low. And we talked a little bit about how we might get the city open to using gray water in San Carlos for uh, irrigation of um, plants. Um, the last thing is feedback from the city on what our energy use is as individuals would be helpful. Like 10 years ago, how many people in San Carlos had solar on their roof versus today? Uh, 10 years ago, how many people were in the Peninsula Clean Energy Eco 100 program versus today? And I think it's a real positive message. And we just, I think there's a real great trend line here that the city might consider messaging. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you, group five. I'm going to go back now to group three. And I would think that the representative is Suzanne Emerson. Suzanne, All right, I'll figure out how to unmute myself one of these days. You're, you're, um, you're, you're, there you are. Thanks. Suzanne. There I am. All right, I'll toss in, uh, let's see, maybe four items we talked about. Uh, we started out by talking about energy efficiency and fuel switching. We discussed the need for reach codes in order to have new construction be all electric instead of burning gas. We talked a lot about um, how to go through um, uh, getting our existing housing stock, some of which is, is you know, 100 years old, um, off of natural gas and um, how to help residents learn how to and afford switching from gas to electric equipment. Um, in the category of transportation, we talked about a bike superhighway, about giving bikes a relatively car-free north-south pathway and possibly even east-west as well. We talked about the need for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, curbside in the area of existing multifamily homes and also on um, in the downtown areas so that people can charge during the daytime when the solar is making the power. In the category of um, mitigation, um, the kinds of mitigation elements, uh, we talked about the need for them, the elements to be impactful, quantifiable, readily implementable by the city, and on an implementation timeline. And then our last takeaway was that every day that we wait gets more expensive, uh, both in dollar costs to address greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and in damage to pe people and nature. That's four. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, group four, JT. Hi. Um, so we uh, wrote down a couple of things we wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Um, the, one of the top things was uh, incentives for developers and new housing to be more energy efficient. Uh, we think this is kind of a, a broad thing to look at um, in terms of getting our carbon emissions down and, and bringing in new businesses and new housing developers into the conversation, into the uh, solution for a lot of these climate um, issues. We also were um, mo uh, mentioned there was also reach code so kind of being part of that is, is making sure it, it is uh, requiring new housing to be done all electric or without uh, natural gas burning. Um, the next was communication and this was kind of in, a, in uh, a couple areas. The first was about waste. We all generally agree that there's uh, a lot of confusion around what's recyclable and what what 
is reusable, what can be used where. Um, so we think greater communication to the general public uh, would be really helpful in that, especially like, you know, targeting students, um, but also the general public would be great. Um, and uh, going along with communication, disaster readiness, uh, and making sure that the city and other agencies are doing their best to uh, communicate with uh, the community on how to best respond personally and as a, as a uh, city as a whole to natural disasters like fires and floods. Um, and then finally, just public transportation as a whole subject, improving that, both uh, creating more access to public transportation in a greater quantity and uh, making it easier to use and more reliable uh, would both go a long way towards uh, increasing public transportation use and getting cars off the road. So that's a, that was our group four points. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, JT. That was great. And thank you to group four. Uh, now uh, for our last one, group six, Michael Campbell. All right, so I guess I'll bring it home here. Um, so our group, uh, when we summarized things, we thought for climate action prevention, the energy and transportation sectors is where the city should focus since those are the, the biggest contributors. On energy, adopting more aggressive reach codes similar to the Menlo Park, then include burnout provisions so that uh, when people are replacing natural gas appliances as they, uh, as they die and, and burn out, that they are re required to replace them with electric um, equivalents, uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, heat pumps for, um, for space heating, but also to ensure that those reach codes are equitable for older homes and for those who are on fixed incomes. So perhaps um, providing um, either uh, financing incentives or, or relief or, or exemptions. On the transportation, we'll just echo what the other groups mentioned, which is uh, especially with the governor's new plan uh, regarding vehicles, is to make sure that multifamily housing units have access to uh, level two or higher chargers. And that can be done through, through codes, through uh, public you know, nearby public facilities, et cetera. But it's really an equity issue, as well as just ensuring that we've got coverage, that all of our housing stock has access. And then finally, on the mitigation or resiliency, um, you know, it's, it's past time to be able to prevent this. The, the, the issues are already here. Fires, smoke from other fires, um, floods uh, and flooding, and so the city can't afford not to uh, adopt resiliency, plan, resiliency plans, whether that be increased fire breaks, reducing fuel loads on city property, private property, and adjacent counter, county property, uh, hardening residences and other buildings, uh, preparing for flooded creeks, uh, whether that's, and then levees or, or other flood protection efforts. So the city has to act to prevent what all the models are uh, already showing and, and, and current events are, are playing out. Okay, thank you, Michael, and to group six. And thank you to all of you who are still with us for, for joining us um, tonight, for participating in our um, small group discussion and for just thinking quite thoughtfully about um, the questions that we pose to you. We know there are many demands for your time, so we really appreciate that you were able to, to dedicate some time to be with us tonight. And we hope that you um, continue to stay engaged with us uh, You as you, you are on the city's list um, if you receive the email. So um, please uh, be sure to monitor your emails. You will, um, Eli, we can go to the next screen. I think we'll, we'll have a follow-up survey um, about tonight. So if you have any comments that uh, occur to you tomorrow after you've slept on it, uh, you definitely feel free to share those to us through Adam. Um, after tonight, we will work as a team, as I mentioned earlier, to review your notes uh, from tonight's workshop and the first workshop and to compile the results, which will help us in our next steps as we work to establish the greenhouse gas reduction targets to develop draft strategies 
um, in response to those targets. We're also uh, working on an inventory and assessing existing actions. So, you know, so now we're going to go back and do a little more technical work and it'll take us a couple months. We'll release information as it's available on the city's website. Um, we'll also keep you updated through all the normal channels that have gotten you to be with us tonight. And we expect our next round of outreach to occur uh, in January, which I assure you will come much faster um, than you think. <laughs> so uh, once again, thank you all very much for joining us. Make sure you've got Adam's email and the city's website. Um, that's a much shorter link than the one that I sent to you in the chat. So that's the one to bookmark. And um, take good care of yourselves and we'll hope to see you here, if not here online in person soon. So good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the workshop. All right, Ari. Good night.